Anyway, Nathan, uh, you've got a company which uh, I'm interested in. I do. Okay, so we do a shared we do a shared OneNote for a few things, and so um, I've put a tab on here for Isaac to look at. So you can have a look at that. Oh, now. I can have a look at it now. Okay. And so I'm the, excited to see this. The if it's the same as right, I'm just going to say, there's I don't no know, chance it's going to be the same. I don't know what it is, but if it's the same company that I'm doing, yeah, I'm going to be very annoyed because okay, then I'm not going to be. I don't think there's any chance. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. So um, this company is called Stem. It's loading so slowly. <laughs> okay, well, it didn't, didn't bring any reaction, so obviously it's Here not what go. you're doing. Stem, okay, I haven't... No, 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 it's not. Yes. Okay, cool. So, um, this is a SPAC. Yes. So, the SPAC, and as I did last time when I talked about IPOE, uh, which was um, SoFi, when, what I'll do again is I'll mainly talk about Stem, and then I'll get to the actual um, acquisition company towards the end. So, um, so the company Stem was founded in 2009, and... Uh, if you were to give it a, a f- like a four-word um, description, it's an AI-driven energy storage company. Wow. Okay. AI-driven needs to be one word for that to work. It's because it's, it's got it's it's got a hyphen. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Technically. So here's an interesting one. So their 2020 annual report states that they're the world's largest network of energy storage systems. Wow. Okay. That's impressive. Are you looking at my things now? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm looking. So the first uh, the first image that you'll see um, coming up here yes. is a storage capacity commissioned. So this is projects that they've embarked on yeah. and final commissioned works. So you can see their STEM, which is the company we're talking about, yeah. um, has uh, just over 600,000 megawatt hours. Yes. Um, and Tesla, very close, just under that, high on electric. Um, and then there's Mitsubishi right down there. NEC makes it onto the list as well. Yep, cool. About half. So um, it's really interesting. Yes. And so the way that they function is if you have a look over at the uh, the second image, uh, this is an image of uh, basically a power network, and it branches out. Um, so it starts in the center, which is basically the generation um, of power, and then it, you kind of oh, see... that's a nice visual. Pretty quickly, it moves out to the first layer of orange, and so that's the first layer of STEM infrastructure. I'll, do, I'll explain this in a minute. Yeah. Um, but that's the first layer of STEM infrastructure, um, which is uh, called FTM, which is front of the meter. And then um, there's a few other layers there. There's uh, some substations, and then uh, there's some distribution generators. And then you'll find, uh, which is basically like in real world, it would be kind of like a generation... Uh, location which then goes to stem infrastructure which holds it in say individual cities which is then distributed to the next layer which is another stem layer yeah which is inside these are battery um systems so inside the stem, stem of the orange um yeah, yeah stem the of the orange, orange. and these yeah. the, so the outer layer are individual um locations so individual business who have adopted this infrastructure okay um, so the first, so the first layer is basically utilities who have adopted the infrastructure, and then the outer layer is individual businesses. And I'll get into that in a second. So, um, so STEM is the first pure play smart energy storage company to go public in the U.S. Again, from their 2020 annual report. Um, so the CEO is a guy named John Carrington. He's had 25 years in the industry, and uh, he, a few other jobs that he did was he's the CEO and director at Myo Soul. Which is which they are basically they make thin solar cells. So he's, he's got industry experience, is what I'm trying to portray there. Yeah. Um, he was the executive vice president of uh, marketing and business development for a company called First Solar, which are publicly listed. You can have a look at them. And he was a part of growing the com- company uh, from 250 to two billion in revenue, and finally to IPO, which is kind of cool. So he's seen that process before, which is really powerful. And he was the GM for a period of time at a company called General Electric, which is pretty. Famous. Oh yeah, yeah. Um. So, noted there. Obviously, he's not a co-founder. So GE was one of the largest. Um, I think it was the, I think it was the top company in, um, in America at one stage. Really? Yeah. Okay. Interesting to see the date there. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what date he was, um, sort of the, the general manager, but maybe he was at that date. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe he ran into the ground. No, I'm just kidding. Could have. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, obviously, we like the. Or I like the co-founder or the founder to be around. Because I think they have a personal, uh, I don't know, there's like an emotional attachment to it that um, might drive uh, the right decisions. And so the chairman is um, also a, co-f- a co-founder and his name's Mike Morgan. So it's nice to have at least the chairman 
uh, involved with the company since its foundations. Um, so I think that's really powerful. So that's a little background on the company. Um, they're headquartered in the US. And so um, in regards to what they provide, products and customer experience, um, it's three different things. So the first one is hardware. So it's the actual battery storage projects that they embark on, which we talked about earlier. And so they form two different um, uh, locations. They form um, front of the meter, which is the utility providers, and then um, behind the meter, which is commercial, industrial uh, businesses. So I'll, I'll again expand on that in a second. Um, so the first thing was hardware. Second thing is software. So they've got a trademarked and proprietized um, software called Athena. And Athena is basically built into all of their um, products, or they offer it in conjunction, I should probably say, with their um, battery solutions. And it can do things like um, optimize for uh, weather forecasts, uh, energy price management. It g- provides a great dashboard um, to see what's happening, uh, value modeling and simulations. Yeah. So basically, you know, you st- stick a big old battery in your basement. It's not going to be much good to you unless it's um, optimized for what's happening with the grid at, at certain points in time or how much power you're using at certain points in time or if there's going to be a big weather situation where there's not going to be ability to generate solar and things like that. Yeah, so they've got a lot of, they've got a lot of analytics that go behind exactly. all the Exactly, a lot of and inputs they know what, yeah. and a lot of ability to analyze. Um, and so that all is AI and so to a certain extent happens um, uh, automatically. And so um, it's kind of cool. Um, and so the third thing, so it was hardware, software, and the third um, product that they, or the third revenue stream, I would say, is market participation, which is more simply uh, selling back to the grid. Um, and so uh, in regards to customers, they've got uh, just, uh, they've got a little over 360 customers. And so this is more business to business, I should mention at the moment. This is not direct to consumer at any point. Um, and they've got more than 30 Fortune 500 companies uh, listed as their customers. So, um, so in front of the meter uh, is the utility providers. Um, and so um, that was that first um, smaller ring that I was mentioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the value add to them to ha- for having their products is it increase, um, increases their asset returns and it supports grid stability. You can imagine... Um, having a, having the ability to, if you're a distributor, you're basically taking um, power in from a larger generation source and distributing it to your local community. Having the ability to store that on site and use it as you need to, or if you foresee less power coming in from the main grid, being able to have that stored in, in reserves and being able to use that in volatile periods where it's weather conditions are changing or whatever, means that the, it overall supports the grid st- stability. So I think that's really cool. Um, and it also um, increases the asset returns, as I said. So um, the second layer, which was that larger circle, they call BTM, which is behind the meter. Yep. Um, and this is commercial industrial partners that they um, have as customers. So some that you may have know, heard of, Amazon, uh, yeah. Walmart, UPS, Apple, Facebook, Alphabet. Oh, they've got big Google, customers. Nice. Home Depot, Wells Fargo. Wow. Um, and so the value add to these companies is it reduces their energy bill as I'll explain in a second. And um, it's also those who have a corporate ESG objective, which is kind of like um, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, is that environmental sustainability and governance? Or environmental social governance. Ah, so close. Yeah. And so there's a lot of uh, push nowadays for um, companies to be thinking along these lines, appointing people who are sort of strategic along these lines. And so this is a way for you to be able to put in your report, you know, this is what we're doing to try and work along those lines. So, if you have a look at the next image, yes. um, it's got two circles, this one, and then two graphs on the right. Uh, I've lost, hang on, I've lost where we are at. Ah, all right, you just continue. So, I'll it's got two circles on the left and then two graphs on the right. And so, the top portion of it is the behind the meter um, commercial and industrial customers. And the bottom graph or the bottom portion of it is the in front of the meter, uh, which is the utility providers and stuff like that. So for the behind the meter guys, you can kind of see there if you look hard that um, when the energy, so the, the orange line is what the grid sees. So that's the consumption that you're using from the actual grid. And you can see there, um, if I just come in here and have a look, 
You can see there the battery um, is the darker portion of it. You can see the battery is charging when the grid is cheaper. So when the energy in the middle of the night or whatever is cheaper, oh, yeah, I see that. Yeah, it yeah. charges. So you can see it drawing down charge. And then when it's more expensive uh, in the middle of the day or whatever it is, then it's outputting. And so obviously it's a simple like concept. Okay, cool. So you can see that the orange line is uh, basically what the grid sees. So that's the, the grid power supplied. You can see the price there as it drops. The battery, which is the darker blue um, portion of the graph, um, is um, charging. It's, it's taking some power, um, which is overall boosting the facility's consumption of power. So you can see facility reaches above that uh, orange line there. And then as, it, as the power becomes more expensive from the grid, then the, um, the battery is engaged and overall makes the facility's um, power consumption from the grid less, reducing costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is really clever because this is something that I've heard about for so many years mm -hmm. as like, oh, it's so much better to just have batteries because everyone's using the generator at the same time, mm -hmm. having a shower at night yeah, and right. watching yeah. TV right. and they're not home during the day and they're not awake in the middle of the night. Correct. So it's like you know, on, on average, it's just so much better. But mm -hmm. it's like something you hear about so often. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, is anyone actually doing anything mm -hmm. for this? You know, yep. so it's a great opportunity. I think it's awesome. So in regards to performance um, of the company itself, um, they state in the, again, in the 2020 annual growth, uh, in the 2020 annual report that they foresee in 2030, in 2030, sorry, uh, 25x growth of the storage market. Um, which is due to two um, things. The first thing is uh, lower cost of renewable generation. So as we start to um, figure out how to be more efficient with our solar and our wind and you know hydro and whatever it is that we're using to yeah. generate, um, that reduces the cost um, and thus um, the demand increases. And um, the, the second input is um, the rapid battery um, hardware cost reduction. So this is actual parts of the battery that are becoming cheaper. It's the same thing with Teslas. You know, at some point the Tesla's going to like, be... Uh, you're going to like my company. It's, oh, um, really? It's pretty similar to this. It's, Perfect. Yes, anyway. So because of those two factors, they see much a high demand. And so they see a 25 times growth by 2030, um, which um, they see a $1.2 trillion dollar market opportunity in this space, um, which is pretty amazing. So, a bit more about their company's financials. They've currently got $500 million in net cash available, um, with, with debt on the balance sheet being zero after this merger. Oh, wow. So, um, it's pretty amazing. They're going to be able to expand and do um, you know, a, a lot of awesome stuff with, with the capital that they have on hand. Uh, gross margins, this is really interesting. So, the three that I talked about, hardware, software, and market um, participation in regards to revenue, revenue streams. Hardware... Uh, gross margin, so before operating expenses, is uh, ten to thirty percent, kind of average. Yeah. You know, yeah. software. Do you want to guess? Oh, uh, seventy percent. Eighty percent. Oh, they've got it ultra efficient. And it's and it's a recurring SaaS model too. So yeah, if I buy a battery great. from you, using my um, software is going to cost you X amount of dollars a month. Now, how much year. does it average out to? Because like their software could be. Oh, that's a big spider. Um, their software could be. Uh, you know, taking up, they could also, like, they could be doing 10% worth of sales in the software space. In regards to and then software like, versus hardware? And it, yeah, and then the hardware averages mm. at 10%, and then they could be averaging 15% revenue, like, um, margin, I mean. Mm -hmm. so. That's a good question. I don't have the breakdown. Yeah. I do have the, um, hmm. Just uh, let us know in the comments below if, <laughs> okay. you're, uh, if you're interested in researching that. <laughs> um, and the market participation which is selling back to the grid, they also see a approximately 80% margin on that. Uh, there is a breakdown of what you're asking for. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, here we go. Oh. <laughs> so revenue model. You're already on it. <laughs> Look at you go. So 60% of it are basically hardware delivery. Yeah. Cool. Um, which the benefit cool. of that is it's upfront. So whilst it's not recurring, it is upfront capital to be able to use. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, the 30%... 30% is the recurring software model and then uh, somewhere like 10% is the market participation. Um, so uh, year on year growth um, from 2019 to 2020 they saw 65% more projects for the hardware um, deliveries and 94% um, greater revenue uh, for 2020 since 2019 which is cool. Yeah. And they are expected to have a positive EBITDA which is like the net profit <laughs> yep. um, by 2022. Yeah, cool. Um, okay. So, 
Very interesting. Yeah. Now, so so hmm. a lot of companies say ex- like to draw out their yes. earnings to 2022, 2023. Yeah. Oh yes, we're going to be making money by then. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah, and then like 2022 the comes. And, yeah. Oh, 2025. We're going to be profitable then. Correct. Yeah. Anyway, no, I'm sure I'm sure they will be there. Okay. Well, I mean, this industry seems to be growing pretty quick. True. Like the awareness of it has changed a lot in the last two or three years. I mean, they, yeah, I'm sure that they actually have a, a genuine model, like growing growing revenue like that and hmm. growing and having those margins. Hmm. They're going to be doing, you know, they're going to be doing so. all right. Okay, so in regards to the SPAC that I mentioned, so the this is the SPAC is currently on the market. Would you say you like the SPAC? Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so they're merging. So yeah. Uh, STEM emerging with a SPAC um, called Star Peak Energy Transition, okay. which was founded in 2018, um, and it's expected to happen early Q2 2021. They actually did originally say 20. Uh, they originally did say Q1, yeah, um, yeah. but that didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, so I think they're now saying Q2, and the ticket change will change from STPK, which it currently says. Uh, to STEM, it's on the New yes. York Stock Exchange. Yeah, cool. Um, so, Starpig CEO is Eric uh, Shiva, and he's 52. And his previous experience is is in the investment banking world. But the really interesting thing is, he also was previously a researcher um, in oil, gas, and natural gas sectors. Yeah, yeah. So he also understands the industry, but also understands the investment side of it. Um, and he's the co-founder of Starpeak Sponsor LLC, <coughs> which has it <laughs> gets a bit convoluted. But that company um, is a holding company and has a twenty percent ownership of Starpeak. Okay. Um, right. And so he does have some skin in the game. Um, so I would see his personal stake to be somewhere around ten percent. And um, and so the business strategy says, which is really cool. Business strategy for you, sorry, business strategy for Starpeak says uh, identify combine with and maximize the value of a company seeking to be a market leader in and or benefit from the re- increasing global incentives to improve the efficiency of our energy ecosystems and reduced emissions, which are referred to as the energy transition. So that's, what, that's why they call it um, Star Peak Energy Transition, because they see a transition from uh, the current, current energy sources yep. um, to the new ones. And they want to find a company that can basically um, you know, make use of that, make profit from that, whatever. Um, some acquisition criteria uh, for the company that they chose had to be well positioned to benefit from the energy transition positive environmental social impacts without sacrificing a financial return uh, will benefit from our management team's operating exp- expertise have opportunities to grow the business organically and via third party acquisitions well received by public investors including ESG focused investors which is what we mentioned before environment social governance um, expected to generate attractive risk-adjusted returns for our stockholders. Um, so the greater the risk, the more returns expected. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the income statement, a really interesting one for 2020. There's three. So obviously, it's a holding company. It's a shell company. It's a shell company at the moment. And yeah, so yeah. there's three mil of general expenses for 2020 um, that I had to look at. And I was like, oh, I wonder what that is. Like, I wonder if that is the fee paid um, to like the joint managers to, you know, affect the merger. Do you think it'd be like three mil? I don't know. Like, I was just thinking, what, what are they spending three mil on for like general administration expenses? I don't know. Well, you got to pay an investment bank a lot of money. That's to, what I was thinking. To you reckon I, that's so the payment? IPOs, IPOs are, are, are usually gigantic. I think the well, this a is lot like of a the appeal, Yeah, a lot of the appeal on a SPAC is that it's cheaper than yeah. an IPO. Hmm. So, three million sounds a lot cheaper than an IPO. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So could be true. Uh, so the market cap at IPO was four hundred and thirty-six mil. Current market cap, want to guess? Ooh. So. Hang on, IPO. Wait, sorry, what was your what 436 was your million? 436 for million. IPO. All right. This is a pretty huge area, and it looks like they've got some huge, like the the massive power output stuff. Uh, I'm going to say that their yeah. current market cap is. This is the shell company, obviously. This is the SPAC. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say that their current market cap is 20 billion. Holy moly! What is it? <laughs> what? 1.3. Okay, right. <laughs> I thought it was a huge. It's producing more than Tesla. <laughs> No, no, but in they haven't merged yet. Okay, yeah, I know, I know they haven't merged yet, but people, once people expect it to merge, like. Also, have you heard anyone talk about this company? It's true, I haven't. Yeah. yeah. Um, some of those, they, some of them fly out the under the radar. It's true. Yeah. Um, share price started at ten dollars. It's currently twenty seven forty. Okay. Okay. One hundred eighty percent increase. So, uh, since August, which is when IPO'd, yeah, it's seen one hundred eighty percent increase. 
um, and the manager, Credit Suisse and uh, Goldman Sachs for the merger. And Good old Goldman. The ownership of STPK currently is uh, less than 1% individual insiders um, because, as I mentioned, the insider owns uh, 20% of the holding company. The holding company, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. falls into the institutions portion of this, which yep. is 64%. Um, and so Star Peak Sponsorship LLC, which is that holding company, um, it owns 20%. Citigroup recently announced, uh, like earlier this week, that they bought just under, oh, not just under actually, significantly less than 1%. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still a fair bit. Um, I think it's something like 47,000 shares. Uh, the general public own 15% and public companies 20%. So, uh, in summing it up, um, I think it's a cool company. I like it because I think it plays in a cool space. Uh, and I, it's not a hype company. Yeah, that's true. Too much. Yeah. There is obviously still some niche hype around that, but um, it's, uh, you know, it's not one of these crazy solar companies. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I like it. Cool. Thanks. He likes the spec. I like it.